evening and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk About Mental Health. I'm Nels Kloster, an addiction psychiatrist working in Southern Vermont. And I'm Robert Stack, a licensed alcohol and drug counselor and a licensed mental health counselor. Good evening. Yeah, and tonight we have a guest on our show who is uh, Skyping in to us from uh, Boston, uh, Robert Whitaker. He's a uh, renowned author about two uh, recent books that have garnered a lot of attention about mental health. The uh, most recent one is Anatomy of an Epidemic. Uh, he'll be talking uh, about the themes of that book at Brooks Memorial Library uh, exactly a week from today, the 31st at uh, 7 o'clock. And his uh, earlier book was Madden America, which was a, a history and I guess dare say an indictment of uh, mental health treatment uh, in America. And uh, for that one also there's a website that goes by the same name, Madden America, for those of you who are interested in this uh, wonderful website with a wealth of information. Robert, welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So one of the things that fascinated is what got you started in this? That's probably a good way to, to introduce the topics. Yeah. I got started in really a, a backdoor manner. Um, I had left actually daily journalism. I had started a company that focused on basically the development of new drugs. And while I it was a publishing company, and while I had that company, it, it just came to my attention, this is when the new atypical antipsychotics uh, came out, that there actually had been a lot of deaths in those clinical trials. So then I go to the Boston Globe, which I'd written for now and then, to write about basically these unreported deaths and sort of abuses of psychiatric patients in research settings. And I was just going to write that series. I honestly didn't have any particular interest in mental health beyond sort of as part of a larger health scene. And then I came upon a study by the World Health Organization in which, the, and it was actually two studies by the World Health Organization in which they had twice found that outcomes for schizophrenia patients were much better in the poor countries of the world, three poor countries, India, Colombia, and Nigeria, than in the U.S. and other rich countries. And the World Health Organization investigators actually concluded that, quote, living in a developed country is a strong predictor, if you're diagnosed with schizophrenia, that you won't have a good outcome. And I wondered was, well, why would living in a developed country be a predictor that you'll have a poor outcome if you're diagnosed with schizophrenia? And it really was a curiosity about that odd result that led me on this long path of reporting about uh, psychiatric care in this country. Yeah, yeah I, I remember that study coming out. It was around the time that I was uh, finishing up residency. And, of course, a very heavy influence influence by pharmaceutical companies, the, what they call the, the atypical antipsychotics or second generation antipsychotics. I mean, I mean, that was so strong, we didn't even look at the old medications, and we very much were in this paradigm of this was lifetime treatment. This was like what, I'm sorry? It was lifetime treatment. Yes. That, you know, the, there was no idea of stopping these medications, and then when that study came out, it was like, how can this be? It, exactly. I mean, what we're speaking about here is, and, and by the way, when I wrote for the Boston Globe, I, I, one of the one of the uh, articles we wrote about was how wrong it would be ever to stop antipsychotic treatments mm -hmm. in people diagnosed with schizophrenia. But here you have these outcomes in the World Health Organization where outcomes were much better where they just used the drug short term and only something like 16% of people were maintained on antipsychotics long term. And that suddenly, you know, that, that, that confounded everything I knew to be true about schizophrenia. In other words, that they had to be necessarily everybody on the drugs for life and yet here in India and Nigeria, where outcomes were much better, only a small percentage were being maintained on the drugs. So this was the beginning of, of, of my wanting to really dig into the scientific literature and the whole story and see what was going on and what, what story really could be found in the scientific literature about what we knew about schizophrenia, the effectiveness of the drug treatments, that sort of thing. Well, one of the things that strikes me, though, in reading your books, is that it's not just schizophrenia. And it looks like there's actually, and I don't want to be, you know, but there's this combination between um, psychiatry, uh, drug companies. Um, the, the, whole, the whole system seems like symbiotic, but it's all based on the idea of medications, of identification, a DSM, uh, illnesses, uh, and here's how we're going to treat them. And it just, it, it, you know, you talked about one of your books about bipolar illness and, the, and how they decided, you know, with lithium. And then, it, you know, they expanded bipolar to children and how that went. And they, so I'm just really, it, it, it isn't just the idea, but gee, well, maybe we misunderstand 
how to treat schizophrenia. There's something much larger afoot here. Yeah, I, I honestly believe now that our society is lost, intellectually lost in, in thinking about mental disorders. And you can even track the rise of this sort of intellectual uh, falling. And what happens is, so we go back to 1980, which is when the American Psychiatric Association publishes the third edition of its Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and they decide at that moment, really pretty arbitrarily, to adopt a disease model. And it wasn't that this new uh, way of thinking about disorders really arose out of some breakthroughs in understanding the biology of mental disorders. It was just a decision, sort of a way to reposition psychiatry. And once that happens, you see over the next couple of decades this symbiosis you're talking about develop. And basically what you see is pharmaceutical companies beginning to pay academic psychiatrists a lot of money to be speakers, advisors, consultants. In essence, academic psychiatry gets captured by industry. There's also money going to the APA. And because of that, you really see that the storytelling apparatus in our society around what we know about psychiatric disorders and the effectiveness that drugs becomes a marketing apparatus. I hate to say it, but it's true. And you were talking earlier about the hoo-ha around the atypicals. You know, they, they brought to market and they said, oh, they're so much better than these old drugs. We practically found a cure for schizophrenia. Well, one of the very first things I did was look at the actual trial results sent to the FDA, and they weren't any better than the old drugs. So this was a moment you saw that Science was saying one story, really no better than the old drugs, and society was hearing about, wow, we have these breakthrough medications. And it's because of this, this capture of the storytelling in our society by commercial forces. And really what has happened then is that has led to a very diluted understanding of so much. So, for example, the chemical imbalance story that we were told that depression is due to low serotonin. You can track that and it, it arose in an honest way as a hypothesis, but the, even in the 1980s they were basically finding not so. People with depression did not have characteristically sort of abnormally low serotonergic systems. But it was continued to be promoted to the American public in order to sell SSRIs. And that's, that's an example where you see this intellectual, how we've become intellectually lost. I, 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 and I think that's a Thank you for saying that, because I think it's a huge problem. You sit at home and watch TV, and you watch Coca-Cola sell you a soda, and you know that it makes you fat and obese and it has sugar, and you sort of understand, and uh, you can watch them try and sell you a car. But when drug companies are selling you a product, they sort of get a, a, a pass almost. We accept that they're acting in our best interest. Oh, by the way, we had this new drug that's going to help you. And, and I don't think people really see that drug companies advertise, and I, you're going to hear this all the time, they have a fiduciary uh, responsibility to their shareholders to maximize their profits, blah, 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 and to sell these products to compensate for their research and development. But I, I'm telling you, I think it's gone way over that. I hear people who are on medicine, and they're looking right in the eye and say, well, I have a chemical imbalance. And they, they take it as the gospel because they heard it. They heard it, you know, from a drug company. Uh, yeah, no, I think what happens here is, is, is medications get promoted to the public in a different environment than Coke does. So Coke, we realize, is a commercial product, right? Yeah. yeah. But a medication comes within the context of, 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 of medicine. And we really cherish medicine in the United States, and we can look back and see some medications that were brought forward that changed our society in a wonderful way, antibiotics. And so we, we really do have a belief in, in how powerful agents for the good they can be. Think about doctors. Doctors generally are seen as really cherished individuals in our society. They're held up on a pedestal. We expect them to put the interests of patients first. So we have a hard time understanding I mean, that's how we think about medication. And they get approved by the FDA too, right? Yeah. So there's a sense that the society, the experts in society, have in fact signed off on these drugs as good, necessarily good even over the long term. And we wouldn't expect a medical community, so to speak, to lie to us and tell us that we have chemical imbalances when we don't. So we have a hard time separating that commercial message 
from our belief that we're in a medical environment where we expect the patient's interests always to be put first. And I, I think that's why this chemical imbalance story took hold. We, we, we wouldn't think that it was just a marketing message. I mean, you wouldn't think that you would tell people with a heart condition they have a hole in the heart in order to sell them a, a heart medication. So why would you think that you'd tell people with depression they have a chemical imbalance that then is fixed by a drug like insulin for diabetes if it's not true? Yeah. By the way, as a reporter, I wrote that. I was shocked when, and, and I'll tell you something. I wrote that, and I remember speaking with a very famous psychiatrist, and I said, you know, I would just like to go to the research where it shows that you found people with depression had low serotonin. And that person says to me this, and this is, I was shocked. He says, well, that's not really true. I said, what do you mean it's not really true? He says, it's a metaphor. I said, a metaphor? He says, yeah, it's a metaphor we use to get people to take their drugs because we know they're good for them. I was stunned. I, I thought it was true. I thought it was a scientific truth. And next thing you know, the minute I asked to see the science, they said, well, it's not really true. And that was the beginning for me of the sense that there's a story being told in our country about psychiatric dis disorders and what the drugs do that's really out of sync with the underlying science. And that's right, right. one of the things I've tried to do in, in, in this book. And what you've pointed out is, is one reason why. It's the direct-to-consumer advertising. Yeah, and that's come yeah. up in a number of places. I, I was really shocked, I mean, in your book and some others as well, <clears throat> there's sort of this, this backward process that's happening. So rather than, say, determining, like with antibiotics, there's a certain uh, uh, bacteria and this antibiotic then interferes with the reproduction of that and sort of kills that bacteria. It's like pharmaceutical companies that are minor tweaks on existing medications, been able to get patents for that. And then sort of saying, well, I think this helps for this thing here, whether it's, you know, restless legs or, or you know, the idea of, uh, you know, improving people's moods. And then it gets sort of sold in our relationship with, you know, so the American Psychiatric Association, the, the DSM manuals, and then the pharmaceutical companies, almost, it has us in their back pocket. And we're not recognizing as, as physicians how vulnerable we've been to marketing, how much we're being driven by these market forces, and then sort of dressing that up as being good science for good medicine. Yeah, I didn't hear everything, but I think one of the things we do need to understand, if I'm not precisely answering this because you were going in and out on the Skype, um, is that physicians were betrayed by this as well. This whole process betrays physicians, psychiatrists, and it definitely gets in the way of that therapeutic relationship, which it should be where someone comes, tells their story, and you listen, and then you try to figure things out together, right? But right. Right. next thing you know, psychiatrists, the working psychiatrist is told stuff that's not true. The, the working psychiatrist doesn't know really about the data that's sent to the FDA, so they're, they're sort of in the blind about that. And then the direct-to-consumer advertising goes straight to the consumer, so the next thing they show up at the psychiatrist's office saying, well, I want this drug. You know, I, I, it must be good for me. And it, 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 everything is disrupted about a normal therapeutic process. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, just, it's broken because of the storytelling and because of the way that this direct-to-consumer information is going. It, it, it actually negates the doctor's authority. Yeah. And, and that's been a big piece of this, too, I think has come out in the literature a lot, is that uh, psychiatry in many ways over time, I mean, as you had uh, outlined in Mad in America, there have been some very uh, harmful treatments, and you have to wonder about the motivation behind the development of these treatments back in the 1800s, even through the 1900s. And, and so a lot of this seems to be tied up in psychiatry sort of fighting for respect as a profession and, and how we might sort of lose our way in that struggle for, uh, for respect uh, for what we do. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the why the American Psychiatric Association adopted a, a disease model in 1980, wanting respect was, was a reason for it. And you can even, I mean, there's a couple things here. Psychiatry, is, as, as you know, has long had this odd place in society. And who is it really serving? Is it serving the people in the hospitals? Or is it serving society to sort of quiet these people or, you know, to sort of manage these people that society doesn't like so much? So who are, who's really, who are you serving, the patients or society? So there's this mix, actually. And then that's one, because the mind is so f 
incredibly complex, and these things aren't, you know, there is no bacteria to be identified, so to speak. It, 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 it obviously, psychiatry, it's not as easy in some ways as infectious illness, right? right? It's a much more complicated thing to do. And then finally, what happens in the 70s, we get a lot of other talk therapists, right? So next thing you know, psychiatrists are in competition with social workers, counselors. You add all that up together, they're sometimes criticized for being sort of acting as police, not real doctors because we don't know the pathology of mental disorders. And then you have this economic competition and you do see that psychiatry said, okay, we're going to put on the white coat like internal medicine people because that's a very prestigious place in society. And that's part of what psychiatry did from 1980 forward. 1980 forward was try to present themselves as medical, you know, in this biological model. The problem is, again, going to this way we've lost our way is we didn't find things scientifically that explain, you know, that allow for a pathological approach to treatment because we didn't identify the pathology. Now, there's no... There's no shame in that. Think about this. This is the mind, this incredible thing. But psychiatry was so intent on telling a story of progress and really an infectious disease model. Oh, you know, like insulin for diabetes. The, the psychiatry itself allowed itself to be captured quite easily and, and, and get involved in that sort of warlike infectious medicine story. And it's just not true. And, and, and that's a problem for us as a society, I think. And I want to make sure that it's clear to folks that there are clients who do benefit from medications, if they're the right medications, at the right time, and at the right dosage. And, but it's not, uh, Lorman wrote a book about the split in psychiatry between talk therapy and, and giving medicines and giving prescribed medicines. And I think, uh, I mentioned this earlier, you know, you sit at home and you watch uh, Abilify. There's a commercial for if you're already on antidepressants, but you're not quite happy enough yet, you know, we'll give you, we'll, we have Abilify. And the, and the commercials look like, oh, that looks like a nice, you know, nice couple, a nice family. And, you know, it looks like everything's pretty good. And Abilify will just put you over the edge, you know, just make it a little bit better. And it's the selling of a drug. I mean, it's. Uh, I remember with the Zoloft commercial, I had that little egg that sort of was wants to make a sad egg to a happy egg, and people would come in and say, "I want to look like that egg." You know, I don't know what drug, I don't know what medication that was, but I want to be happy like that egg that was bouncing around uh, in the Zoloft advertisement. <laughs> it, it's very effective. Right, it's very effective. You're usually walking on a beach. Obviously, yeah. the, whoever you're with is beautiful, right? Yeah. yeah. And you're smiling. Who doesn't want to be doing that? I want that, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, I'm ready to like, like, like Viagra will teach me how to dance, right? Or the Cialis. I mean, it's, it's, it's really incredible what they've done. And, you know, it's, I wonder about the largest force, larger forces at, at, at play at this because it's almost as if, as if the work ethic is, is missing around this. I mean, I understand that in psychiatry, if we're not, if we're going to be physicians and MDs, that sounds like medication has to be involved. Uh, you know, I don't think we're out of the day of doing sort of surgeries like lobotomies and such. But if we then are just doing the sort of the talk piece of it, you're right. How are we different from other folks than sort of the old sort of criticism is why would I go to medical school to become a psychiatrist? But, but I'm seeing it is discouraging sort of in private practice. People come in, they have a certain medication they want, they know what they want. And if you suggest maybe you should do talk therapy, there's this thing called cognitive behavioral therapy, which takes effort, homework, uh, examining the way thinking and feeling are tied into each other. They walk away. It's almost like you need that pill to sort of entice them to stay in, in treatment. And it's, uh, it's a very large issue, it seems, that I just I want a quick way to feeling better. Yeah. You know, I want to, and this it goes with what you're saying. Yeah. The, 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 obviously, the medications have a place. That's, that's key. Obviously, sometimes they're really helpful over the short term, managing some symptoms, and some people do well in the long term. But what science is also telling us about medications is, A, they're not fixing any known pathology. B, they do change the brain. And so which, once that happens, it can be hard to get off. So going on sort of is a profound thing to do. And if you look at the long-term outcomes, and this goes back to the World Health Organization study, there's a lot of evidence showing that over the long term, they sort of increase the chronicity of disorders. So 
to use medication smartly really requires a lot of knowledge about when to use them, who to use them, what doses, and how long. And that actually does require someone who knows a lot and can integrate it into a, a sort of more holistic form of care. But what we've sold people on, which is what you're talking on, is there's this magic bullet. You don't have to work at this, and it'll make you better in two weeks, which is really pretty ridiculous when you think about, you know, a mind that is struggling with itself and the ways that minds can struggle. It, it, there's, there, it's never going to be a magic bullet that just sets the mind straight. Being alive is too difficult, but that's the message, and that's what you're stuck with. You're stuck with, I'm talking about psychiatrists, supposedly you vend these magical pills, and no one wants to pay for uh, sort of helping people really back to a path of wellness and figuring out what place the medications have in that pathway. And the message is it's not easy. Yeah. I mean, that's the truth of the matter, right? Yeah, and it's yeah. been very, very effective marketing because even when I get people engaged in talk therapies, when they start to struggle, they're still like, well, the meds aren't right. And it's almost like, wow, we've been, we've been talking and working on this, and now all of a sudden that there's a challenge, it's back to the medication. So it seems to be a very easy sort of fallback that people are still hanging on to that idea that, that the medication by itself can be effective. And I think that's one of the things that fell apart with the deinstitutionalization of patients. They were in such a rush to close these institutions, which actually I think benefited some people. I mean, it gave them a place to live, to function, and sure there were abuses and wrong things about it, but it almost became, uh, you know, we'll get them out of the institution, but where do they end up? They end up in jails, they end up in the street. And what's the number one complaint? Well, they're not taking their meds. They're off their meds. And nobody ever asks, why do the consumers not want to take the medicine? You know what I mean? Like they, you know, anybody else, if you hear this, you would say, well, one of our problems is uh, we want them to take their medicine, but they don't want to take it. Well, ask them why they don't want to take it. I mean, really, it sort of, uh, it, it just doesn't happen. And, it, and I, I think we have to sort of, and I, I hope that you'll explain this to us in, in maybe another day, but how do we unwind this? How do we do Groundhog Day? How do we do this over again? And yeah, yeah. I mean, a, who's allowed to define the quality of life? Right. So if you take this medication, you don't feel that it impacts the quality of your life because you feel sick every day or, or you feel clouded in your, your mind, then, then who are we as, as, as physicians to say, there's a problem with your compliance. You're not taking this medication. It's like we're not listening to them right. whatsoever. It's not a partnership at that point. Yeah, this is the, this I think is is it goes to the heart of one of the therapeutic problems out there, is that when the patient or the person says, "Listen, I don't like these meds. I don't like these antipsychotics. You know, my sexual life is ruined. I can't think. I'm emotionally disengaged. I feel like a zombie. What sort of life do I have?" Instead of people responding to that and saying, "And this goes way back. I mean, in the '60s, you'll hear instead of responding to that and honoring it." What are we? What are psychiatrists taught to say? Oh, they lack insight. Take your drugs anyway. Right. Right. That, you know, that that breaks a therapeutic relationship right from the beginning. And the real tragedy here is this: there is plenty of evidence that showing that a sizable percentage of people, even diagnosed with a psychotic disorder, would do better off medications long term. And in fact, when they complain, they have a reason to complain. They can see that their functionality is being impaired. And we even have this beautiful study that just came out of um, Australia where they said, okay, we're going to put all our efforts into making sure people comply. And the thought is if people comply, they'll have better outcomes, right? Well, with this program at the end of two years, they did increase compliance. But you know what they found? The compliant people actually had lower functional outcomes and for some of the very reasons we're talking about, sort of disengagement with work and that sort of thing. So you asked about rewinding this whole story, this is part of what we need to rewind. And it needs to be rewound in a way where one of the first things we do is you listen to people, right? Do they like the medication or not? And if they don't like it, what can be done differently? And one other thing that you're talking about here, this whole deinstitutionalization did get going on a false premise that antipsychotics will make it possible for people to live fairly normal lives in the community, yeah. right? Yeah. It's just not true, right? I mean, if there, if that's not enough. The drugs can be helpful in some instances, but it's clearly not enough. And the other thing is this. Think of the word asylum. The hospitals were first called asylums. What's an asylum? It's a refuge. 
It's a refuge for people who are really struggling out in the world. And sometimes what, is that, what do they need? Shelter, food, a place to be, protection. We gave that up. And some people do benefit from that for, say, six months, 10 months, 12 months. And, it, and, and last thing, sorry I'm getting wound up here. If you go to the 1950s, California did a <clears throat> study of first episode psychosis. And they looked at in 56, 57. They looked at all the people who got medicated and all those people who did not get medicated. Do you know that people who did not get placed on meds actually had a higher discharge rate at the end of 12 months? But the point was, they didn't get out in one week. They didn't get out in two weeks. They got out starting really at about starting at six months and then you'd see this progressive discharge rate. So what you do see in that data is if you provide a safe place, you don't need to medicate everybody. And in fact, you'll see a lot of natural healing. And it, going back to those studies in the 50s, something like 70% would still be living independently five years later. So what you really see is if you provide a safe place, an asylum, and give people time to heal, a lot of percentage, a lot of people can get better from a psychotic episode without ever going on the medications. But you need a safe place. You can't, you can't just throw them out in the community. No, and I, and I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I'm so worried about this, you know, like with PTSD now. You know, I remember back in, you know, with Vietnam veterans, and they were trying to treat them with medicine and benzodiazepines and, you know, and they have problems with substance abuse and then they would have problems with mixing and they were dual disorders. And I'm so afraid that we're going to get to this thing again. We got a lot of soldiers coming home. They have PTSD and I think there's an urge to medicate them. And at the same time, it's just like you said, a lot of them just need a place to be safe. They need a place to talk. Uh, yes, they might have symptoms. Yes, they might have sleep disturbances. But boy, I tell you, be careful with these meds. I, I, I just worry about it. Well, listen, I think what we're doing to our veterans is, is, is a national shame. Obviously, the veterans so often have to reintegrate into our society. They've had an experience that is so foreign to what life is like here. And it's just hard to come back it, and with the trauma and all. That takes time as well. And I, I know what we're doing to these veterans. They're on often three, four, five drugs, and now they're stuck as they come back, and next thing you know, they're a mental patient, yeah, right? Yeah. It's just horrible what's happening to the veterans. It's, un it's, un it's unfair yeah. to them because now they're mentally ill. First, they're soldiers fighting for our country, and now they're like, well, now they're really sick, you know, and they got mental illness, and we're medicating them. And they're, oh, it's, yeah. I, but in a big, I think the, the paradigm has become such that if you're not giving a medication, you're not engaging in an intervention. You're not doing a treatment. Um, and the idea, like back from the Quaker days with moral treatment, you could say they were doing nothing. They were not giving medications. They were not doing the sort of torturous treatments like, you know, ice cold water baths, dunking, near drowning and things. But they were doing something. It was, it was giving kindness. It was giving support. It was giving a, a comforting place to live. And I think we've lost sight of the idea that that in itself, the, the real key of the therapeutic relationship, that sort of the, that caring and giving of yourself, is actually a very powerful intervention. And giving asylum or a place to be uh, safe is also an intervention, and not just medications. We're, yeah. we're coming to a close, and I just want to say, you know, we're looking forward to having you, hosting you here next week at the Brattleboro Library. You'll be giving a talk. Um, you want to say a little bit about what you'll be talking about? We've got about 30 seconds. Yeah, sure. Basically, I'm going to be talking about this book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, looking at why so many people are ending up on disability in our country, and also looking at what is science telling us about the long-term effects of psychiatric medications? Okay. okay. Are they really helping people recover or not? All right. All right. And I'm looking forward to us meeting with you next week. And thank you so much. It's been great talking to you. Yeah, we could have gone forever with this, I think. How about some, it's a needed discussion, I think. So thank, thank you. you.